Well, very good morning to you all. Great to have you here. Another great day of the week. The best day of the week is Sunday. Yes? Amen. Um, look, if you're visiting with us for the very first time, we want to make you welcome, a uh, special uh, welcome to you. If you're on Zoom, uh, welcome to you guys as well. Uh, glad to have you, whether in body or in spirit or otherwise, in virtual. Um, but it's nice to see smiling faces that we can interact with, uh, most certainly. Um, we are going to worship the Lord this morning um, on the subject of slaves. And uh, Josh Dendell is uh, going to open the scriptures for us a bit later on. So we're looking forward to that. Um, I want to read uh, um, our opening passage for us from Psalms. But before I do that also, uh, just a reminder for those of you who may have little children uh, that we have got a private room just behind the wall here. Uh, make your way through the doors. We've also got Sunday school uh, for little children as well, if you've got them with you. Certainly got a few of them here this morning. All right, I'm going to uh, read from Psalm 29, if we'd like to just uh, focus on, uh, on the scriptures as I read them to you, just to help us uh, get our minds around where we are and why we are here and what we're about to do. Psalm 29, David writes these words. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord... Glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is throned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Wonderful words of um, comfort, the wonderful words of exaltation to our God that we serve. So let's just bow in a word of prayer, shall we? Our Lord God, we want to bring to you the, uh, the majesty and the glory that is ascribed to you. And Lord, we want to glory in who you are and who you've declared. And Lord, we want to we want to worship you. We ask, O oh Lord, that you be with us this morning in spirit and in truth, in our hearts, and help us to worship you in a way that honors you. Lord, as we look around our creation, everything speaks and screams and shouts of who you are and the way that it is made. So, Lord, be with us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, we want to um, open our time of singing and worship to you, uh, Christ, our hope in life and death. So let's stand, shall we, as we um, uh, celebrate this day. What is 
is our hope in life and death. Christ alone, Christ alone, what is our only confidence? That our souls belong to Him Who holds our days within His hand What comes apart from His command And what will keep us to the end The love of Christ in which we stand Oh, sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal, oh sing hallelujah, now we'll never we confess, Christ our hope in life and death. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith with His rise, who stands above the stormy trial, who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of the hope in life and death unto the grave what will we sing Christ he lives Christ he lives and what reward will heaven bring everlasting life with him there we will rise to meet Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed, and we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now we're never Christ our hope in life and death Oh, sing hallelujah Our hope springs eternal Oh, sing hallelujah Now whenever we confess Christ our hope in life and death Now whenever we confess Christ our hope in life and death Just uh, continue to worship the Lord, Jesus, strong and kind.
Jesus said that if I fear, I should come to Him. No one else can be my shield. I should come to Him. For the Lord is good and faithful. He will keep us day. song. Please be seated. We're not going to have uh, kids talk this morning. Uh, Nadia is going to take the children out the back and give them a uh, kids talk out there in private, uh, only because we got uh, communion this morning and uh, we'll be pushing for a little bit of time. So if all the children want to get up and uh, make your way happily out to the back. In a couple of minutes, Janessa is going to bring prayers to us. Uh, and uh, But prior to that, there, I've just got a couple of announcements to make there. The Perises are away at a conference, the Reach Australia conference, this Sunday and uh, next Sunday, so they'll be away. And as I mentioned before there, Josh Dendalk is going to open the word to us uh, from Romans chapter 6 on the subject of slaves. Um, a very exciting subject. <laughs> we love being slaves, don't we? Uh, whether we like it or not, we are slaves, as we know. Um, look, one of the other uh, very sad announcements this morning that most of you have probably caught up with uh, already is the passing away of David Seacombe. And um, it's, uh, it's with great sadness, of course, that Sunday by Sunday when he turns up here, you know, see his beaming face, uh, having served the Lord, you know, year after year, decade after decade, and we won't see him until glory. But it's uh, great news. It's great news that we will see each other with a new body, with our smiles uh, back on our faces as well. But um, we, uh, we want to comfort Margaret as well and um, uh, David's family, extended family, and uh, the service is going to be on the 15th um, of May, which is Monday week, at Central Prezi Church in Ipswich. Right, so that's at 1.30 p.m. All the details of that there uh, is in your notices as well. Uh, so that is, I think, all the announcements. We're going to um, uh, have our... Um, our supper later on, 
uh, which Andrew is going to uh, take for us as well. Janessa, lead us in the time of prayer, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Let's pray together. Lord, our Father in heaven, we pray to you now, meditating on your word in Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that waits at noonday. As we pray this psalm, Lord, we're reminded that fear will not overcome us because you are good and faithful. You are trustworthy and you shelter us from the storms raging within us and around us. Remind us that you are our safe place always and lead us into a deeper trust in you. Father, as a church family, we come to you celebrating the life of David Seckham and also grieving his death. We see that he was a man who knew you and loved you, a man who received your gift of undeserved grace for the forgiveness of his sins. Thank you for the life you gave him and for the ways he loved others and shared the good news of Jesus. We pray that you will shelter Margaret under your wings as she grieves, and that you will provide comfort to all of David's friends and family, including his daughters Rachel and Elizabeth. We grieve, but not as people without hope, because we believe in the resurrection. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Father, we want to pray for others in our church family too. Please continue to provide strength and rest and hope for Sam and Dan and Ruth and Rachel in this season of recovery. Help them to keep trusting in you as they face uncertainties. Please give strength to Marga and Lyle and Joellen and Belinda as they wake each day and seek to live for you amidst the trials and suffering of this life. And we pray for spiritual refreshment and growth for Rohan and Heather as they spend time away at the Reach Australia conference. And Father God, our hearts ache for the people of Sudan and we cry out to you for peace for this country. Please bring a swift end to the terrible violence and bloodshed. We pray that food and medical aid will reach the people. We pray for your church there. We can't even imagine what it must be like to be living through what they are. Please protect them. Encourage their hearts with reminders that you care deeply for them, that you are with them and that your heart breaks too over the loss of precious lives and the inhumanity of the fight for power. May your church in Sudan have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tender hearts and humble minds. May they not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. Let them turn away from evil and do good. Let them seek peace and pursue it, for, this, for to this they are called. Father, may we remember that this is our calling too. In our homes, in our marriages, with our children, with friends and neighbours and colleagues, with strangers we meet only once, Cause us to turn away from evil and do good and help us to seek peace and pursue it. For the glory of your name, God, who's promised to bring eternal peace to this world through Jesus. We love you. Amen. Okay, we're going to stand and uh, join together in singing our next song, His Mercy is More. Um, so let's, let's, let's just stand, shall we, and uh, sing these words. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, 
he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore, our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new and more, our sins they are many, his mercy is more. Love could remember no wrongs we have done. On this, you all knowing he counts not their son. Thrown into the sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the vilest the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more stronger than dark Since they are many, his mercy is more. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger the darkness, new every more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. All right, y'all, please be seated. Our Bible reading is from Romans chapter 6, verses 15 to 23. Morning, everyone. Let's read the Word of God together. We're going to read from Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 15. And it says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, as sla- sorry, slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at the time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God... The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a joy to be sharing in God's Word with you this morning. Let me pray as we get started. Heavenly Father, uh, as we look at your Word this morning, may you reveal our hearts to us. May we be captured by the joy, the better vision that you hold out to us through Jesus this morning. Uh, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There's a question um, I've always struggled with as a Christian. Um, and it's, it's a question that gets right to the heart of, of living as a Christian. How do grace and my continued sin go together? Um, I don't know about you, but for me, fighting my sin often just feels really hard. And so, if I'm saved by grace and not my own effort, why can't I just let a few sins through the cracks? Um, I'm not talking about kind of saturating my life with sin. I'm talking about things that just every now and then make it a bit easier. Why can't I lie to someone if it's a bit harmless? Why can't I be angry every now and then? Why can't I just be selfish for one day, take a break from putting others first for a bit? Well, Paul's wrestling with the same question in the second half of chapter 6 here. Um, but before we get to that, let's quickly have a look at where we've come in Romans. Um, we've seen in the first half of Romans how all have sinned and fall short of God, uh, the glory of God. We're under God's judgment. Um, but we've also seen how we can have peace with God and fix this problem through faith in Jesus. We've been made right with God. We, we stand in the grace that he gives us. More recently, we've seen in chapter 5, all humanity was under the reign of sin through Adam's disobedience. But God sent a better Adam, Jesus Christ, who now pours his grace out onto us through Jesus' reign. And, and then last week, we came to the first of two objections to, to this idea of grace. And it was, if grace increases as, as sin increases, can't we just sin it up, sin all the more? And Paul's answer was an emphatic no, by no means. Through faith, we're united to Christ. We have died to sin, and so we live for God. And so we saw last week we should be true to our new selves, united to Christ, by considering ourselves as God considers us, and by having zero tolerance for sin, and by offering ourselves daily to God. But we can only do that in God's grace, which is where Paul landed last week in verse 14. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. We're not under the power of sin anymore. We're under grace. But that leads us to that same question we had at the start. Um, uh, and it's the question Paul starts with in verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Why should we put in the effort into the difficult, messy process of dealing with sin in our lives to live entirely for God? Can't we just sin just, just a little if we're under grace? No way, says Paul. It's a, it's a super emphatic answer. By no means, no way. Paul knows this is a deadly way to think for Christians. It kind of cracks open the door for our sinful hearts to justify sin in our lives. <coughs> Um, and Paul's answer to us today lays out two choices and guides us through the implications of each choice. He shows us there are two ways to slave, two spirals to choose, and ultimately two eternities to face. So let's dive in with two ways to slave. You may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble. You may like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world, you may be a socialite with a long string of pearls, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Um, some of you might recognize those lyrics. Uh, Bob Dylan sang them back in 1979, well before my time. Um, but I kind of wonder if Bob was reading through Romans 6 as he wrote those lyrics, because they're exactly what Paul's saying here. Um, have a look at verse 16 with me. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin which leads to death, 
or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. We like to think we're free people, don't we? Here in the West, we're not slaves to anyone. We make our own choices. But Paul tells us, no, we're not actually free. We're all, every one of us, slaves. And the way that we live, who we obey, shows us who our master really is. Um, It's worth pausing here to kind of break down the idea of what a slave is, Um, because for us, slavery is a really loaded term. Um, We think of the British slave trade that William Wilberforce fought so hard to put an end to. Um, We think of slaves in America chained together on cane plantations. Um, Now, slavery in Roman times, when Paul was writing this letter, could be like that, but it it wasn't always. Um, Slavery was sometimes something people sold themselves into. If you had a, a big debt or something like that, you could sell yourself into slavery to clear it. Um, Not an ideal situation at all, but still something that they chose to enter into sometimes. And and you could work towards buying yourself out of slavery. Um, And it wasn't always brutal or cruel either, as we imagine it. Um, If you had a good master, particularly a Jewish one, you could be treated quite well. But ultimately, slavery was all about absolute obedience to your master. And so this would have been a really familiar thing for the people Paul's writing to, the Romans here. Um, About a third of the Romans' population were slaves. So this would have made them just perk up a little bit and listen. Paul's got their attention. And he should have ours too. Because Paul's point here is really simply, the reality is that we're all slaves to what we obey. Whatever we willingly offer ourselves to, to find value, purpose, to find their identity. Maybe you're a slave to your work, bringing work home, carving out time from what should be family time in slavish obedience. Maybe you're a slave to your stuff, always wanting the next best thing. Maybe you're a slave to your habits or or your temper. Someone once said, you are what you repeatedly do. And and Paul gets that, and he goes further. He says, we are slaves to whatever we repeatedly do. Whatever we obey, we are slaves to. And so when it comes down to it, there are only two ways to slave, Paul says. You're either a slave to sin that leads to death, or you're a slave to obedience, obedience to God that leads to righteousness. There's no kind of middle ground. All humanity is either a slave to sin or a slave to obedience. And we've seen in Romans already that without Jesus, everyone falls in that first category, don't they? And that includes us. We like to think we're free, but ultimately we're slaves to sin. And we show it by our obedience to it. But there's a but there. But in verse 17... But thanks to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. As we're united with Christ, as we saw last week, we're set free from our slavery to sin. We're we're truly free. But hang on. Okay, so we've been set free and now slaves to righteousness. How does that work? That kind of feels like a contradiction. Well, we've already seen there are only two masters to serve, right? Sin or obedience to God, righteousness. And so if we're no longer slaves to sin, then we must be slaves to righteousness. There's no middle ground. So true freedom doesn't mean that we're just released to the wind, kind of untethered with no uh, allegiances or obedience. No, true freedom is in slavery to Christ. True freedom is coming into line with how the world has always meant to be. Um, Imagine a dog. Let's call him Bob. Um, Bob lives in a terrible home. His master kind of kicks him, forgets to feed him. He's not loved or cared for. Um, he longs for freedom, to just get away from it all. And so one day he just he up and leaves. He runs away, 
onto the streets. He's scavenging for food in rubbish skips, fighting over it with the other strays, no safe place to sleep. That's not real freedom either. No, real freedom is a place where Bob's loved, where he's got a family who cares for him deeply, who takes him on walks, plays fetch with him, feeds him properly, gives him a safe place to sleep. That's real freedom. Freedom to belong. Freedom to love and play and enjoy life. And it's the same for us. Real freedom doesn't mean having no master at all. We're just not made that way. It's impossible. Being slaves to Christ, to righteousness, paradoxically brings us true freedom. Obedience to God brings us into a life that's exactly as it's meant to be. And that's where true freedom is. And what does this freedom look like? Have a look at verse 17 again with me. Thanks be to God, you used to be slaves to sin. You have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. Freedom looks like an obedience to the pattern of teaching. Now, what is this kind of pattern of teaching? Well, it's, it's the gospel. It's God's power of salvation for all who believe, who are justified by faith through Jesus' obedience. And it's this gospel that we're given to obey. Uh, notice Paul doesn't say here that we give our allegiance to the gospel. We don't kind of commit ourselves to the teaching. No, it claims our allegiance. Now, the Romans and us are being handed over to the gospel, committed into the gospel's care by God and placed under its authority. A new allegiance, not to sin, but to God. And see how this pattern of teaching changes us? It works from the inside out. You have come to obey from your heart. Our obedience to our new master flows from our transformed hearts. It's not just about obeying rules. We want to do it. This is obedience that flows from the very center of our being, from our hearts. See, just obeying the rules might be able to give us some outward appearance of righteousness, but only the gospel changes our hearts. This is the kind of slavery that Paul's showing us. It's an obedience to God that starts in our hearts, that transforms us and moves outwards. An obedience that brings us true freedom. And so Paul says, don't choose sin, slavery to sin. Have a look with me at verse 19. I'm using an example from your everyday life because of your human limitations. Paul uh, acknowledges his um, uh, analogy here is limited. Um, Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. You are slaves to what you obey, so don't offer yourselves in willing obedience to sin. Offer yourselves in obedience to righteousness, to true freedom. It's only one or the other. Why can't I sin a little if I'm under grace? Because then I'm missing the whole point of grace. Grace isn't there so I can keep living my old life, wallowing in my sinful desires and offering myself in obedience to them, saying, it'll be okay to sin just a bit, right? Because we're under grace. Now, grace enables us to offer ourselves to God in obedience. Grace reveals this true freedom to us, and and it just beckons to us. Move away from your old sinful life towards the beautiful, true freedom found in Christ. It enables us to work really hard to fight our sin. See, what Paul's asking us to do here is to offer ourselves as slaves to righteousness, with the same resolve, with the same determination, we used to offer ourselves to sin, just as you used to offer yourselves um, to impurity and ever-creasing wickedness. So now, offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness. This is an all-of-life endeavor. Um, C.S. Lewis puts it this way in his book, Mere Christianity. Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. 
I have not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires which you think are innocent, as well as the ones you think wicked, the whole outfit. Grace isn't some cosmic get-out-of-jail-free card so that we can keep indulging our sin. Grace is the loving parent on the sidelines as we push forward with all that we are, offering ourselves fully as slaves to righteousness, to true freedom, and catching us when we fall to pick us back up again. Paul's not saying this is going to be easy, but he is saying it will be so worth it. And I think he gives us two great encouragements to keep us choosing the right master. First off, he shows us that each master has a sort of spiral. One's downward to ever-increasing wickedness, and one is gloriously upward, leading to holiness. Have a look at verse 19 again. The first spiral, slavery to sin, is, it's a downward spiral of ever-increasing wickedness. Paul says it's, it's slavery to impurity and lawlessness that leads to more and more impurity and lawlessness. Um, we saw this back in Romans chapter 1, didn't we? The downward spiral away from God and deeper and deeper into depravity. Maybe you've seen this in the lives of those around you. A little sin leads to compulsive sinful behavior. More and more anger, lies, bitterness, grumbling. Their lives at the end are just a complete mess. Slaves to sin, leading to ever-increasing wickedness and ultimately death. But slavery to righteousness is such a glorious opposite. An upward spiral leading us to sanctification to holiness, transforming us daily to be more and more like Jesus. And hopefully you've seen this in others as well. Someone who is kinder, more forgiving, gentle, and loving than they were previously, reflecting the grace of their Savior. Paul knows this journey is going to be hard. I mean, it's going to be hard work wholeheartedly offering ourselves to Christ. Um, and often it feels like two steps forward and, and one step back, or, or even just one step forward and two steps back. But Paul reminds us today, if we've been united with Christ, we are not who we once were. And even though life sometimes just falls down around us, when it's discouraging to look back at, at this past week or even yesterday, we are not who we once were. Um, sometimes I think we imagine our Christian walk as just a kind of straightforward upward line on a graph, just steady growth day by day. But I think in reality, it's much more of a jagged upward growth. We're growing to be more like Jesus. It's a jagged line, though. Sometimes it falls further than we want it to. And sometimes it soars to heights that we couldn't have imagined. Friends, be encouraged. Offer yourselves wholly to Christ. This spiral goes upward. And God's there the whole time. Watching as we get it right, as we get it wrong as well. Cheering us on, changing us by his spirit. And when we reach the end, welcoming us to his heaven. Saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Not who we once were. We've spiraled upwards more and more like Jesus. This week we've grieved with joy, haven't we? At, um, the loss of our dear brother David. Um, many of us, myself included, we haven't known David all that long. Um, but as I've been reflecting on his life this week and seeing on Facebook the comments just pouring in, seeing how many lives God used David to impact with his gospel... I'm so grateful to God for a faithful man who lived a life of wholehearted obedience to his gracious Saviour. Um, even though he'd be the first to tell you he wasn't perfect, he exemplified this life that Paul's calling us to here. Keep going. Remember the end goal. Our holiness, being sanctified until we're called home and glorified. 
And it's that end goal that Paul turns to here for his final encouragement to us in this passage. And he leaves us with two eternities to face. Read with me from verse 20 through to the end. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul does a a quick kind of cost-benefit analysis here, wanting us to clearly see the consequences of our sin. He asks, what did our slavery to sin bring? It brings shame now and ultimately death. Eternal death under God's judgment. But being slaves of God leads to holiness now. And ultimately, it leads to eternal life with God forever. We've got two eternities to choose from here. Notice how Paul talks about freedom there in verse 20. Freedom isn't this endless choice, as we've already seen. It's not doing whatever I want. Now, that's like kind of a fish outside of a fishbowl. Free to do whatever it wants, but it'll die. The fish needs to be inside the fishbowl, where it will live in the environment that it belongs to. Friends, being a slave to sin is not real freedom. It takes a beautiful thing that God has designed and and corrupts it. It promises so much, but only delivers shame and addiction. Sex is a classic example of this. God's good design for sex is to be enjoyed between a husband and a wife in marriage. A selfless act pointing us to the love, life and intimacy of being united with Christ. But sin mutilates sex. It turns it into something selfish, something shameful. Pornography, promiscuous sex, masquerading as intimacy, but delivering only shame. And it kills love in the process. What does it result in? Addiction and death. That's just one example. But there are so many ways that sin promises us freedom but leads only to shame. Greed, the love of money, gambling, alcohol, working without rest, gaming, wasting time entertaining ourselves, distracting ourselves to death. These things promise life Relief from our problems. A way to cope with our broken world and our broken lives. But Paul's saying they only deliver shame and ultimately death. But Paul's not trying to crush us here under a weight of guilt. He's calling us to something far better. He's trying to lift our eyes, pull back the curtain on sin, on the false freedom that it offers us. And showing us that it's, it's not something to play with. It only leads to shame and death. Why would we choose that if we've been set free? Why would we choose slavery to sin over slavery to God? Friends, be encouraged. Live wholeheartedly for Christ. Because it leads to real eternal life. Verse 23 again, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Um, I grew up watching Wizard of Oz. It's quite a few years old now, but it was one of the first movies that used Technicolor that wasn't black and white. Uh, And there's this scene where Dorothy lands in Oz, and the inside of her house is kind of still uh, sepia, kind of greyed out. And then she opens the door to Oz, And it's just revealed to us in wonderful colour. Friends, true freedom is living life in full colour. As we're meant to live it, under God's right rule, as our true master. As slaves to God. And it'll be harder, and yet more wonderful than we can imagine. Why would we choose to live in black and white? Friends, this week we're going to be tempted Tempted to lie, to be selfish, 
to be greedy, to look at things we shouldn't, tempted to say things that will hurt others, we'll be tempted to live out our sinful desires as slaves to sin. Let's not give in. Let's do Paul's cost-benefit analysis. These things lead to death. And let's offer our full selves to God as willing slaves, under grace, living life in full colour, reminding ourselves in those moments of temptation what the life is that we truly want. And it's not the slavery that the devil is deceitfully offering us. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, you give us true life and true freedom. May we never treat the grace you've given us as as a get-out-of-jail-free card, Lord, so that we can keep wallowing in our sins and living as slaves to it. Lord, may we live as your slaves, for there lies true freedom. May we offer ourselves to you with all of our being, being sanctified, spiraling upwards through your Spirit's work in us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Josh, for that uh, reminder. I'm going to be constantly reminded for this coming week there of Technicolor, high definition, full colour experience. That's what we want to aim for. None of this black and white TV stuff. Um, We're going to uh, have our communion service now, and then we'll have our closing hymn uh, at the end of the service. Andrew, would you like to lead us, please? of things. Uh, This is a special meal uh, for those who have faith in Jesus. So if you're someone who knows Jesus Christ, uh, we welcome you to participate in a few moments in the Lord's Supper together, uh, together with us as part of God's people. Uh, I'm now going to uh, read to you uh, from uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11, where Paul describes Uh, what happened when Jesus uh, introduced this special sacrament. Uh, Something that both looks backward to Jesus' death for us and also forward uh, to uh, the feast we'll enjoy with God in heaven after Jesus has come again, put all things right, uh, renewed creation and taken his people home to heaven. So I hear hear Paul's words from uh, 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink, as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we humbly and uh, completely acknowledge to you the greatness of our misery apart from your son, the misery given by sin, our sin, from which uh, no human, no angel, no one was or can deliver us. 
Father, we acknowledge uh, our great unworthiness of the least of all your mercies. And yet we give you thanks for all your benefits, all your gifts and blessings to us. Especially we thank you for that great benefit of our redemption through the gospel of your son. We thank you for your love as, as a father to us. We thank you for the sufferings and the benefits uh, of your son, Jesus Christ, the son of God, through which we're delivered from sin, death and the level and the devil. Father, we thank you for all of your gifts to us, um, which strengthen us as your people, uh, for, for your word, for the sacraments, including the Lord's Supper that we're, going, we're sharing today, uh, through which uh, this sacrament, we thank you uh, that through uh, what we're doing today, uh, Christ, your son, and all of his benefits and blessings to us, your people, we thank you for how these things are applied to us, reminded to us, sealed to our hearts uh, through uh, the Lord's Supper. Father, uh, we thank you and praise you for all these things and we ask now that as we share together the Lord's Supper that you would be strengthening us by your Holy Spirit to continue uh, to serve you, to love you, to please you, to follow you. Amen. Uh, in a moment, uh, Josh and I are going to uh, share, we'll, we'll, we'll um, distribute to each of you uh, a small COVID safe um, communion uh, package. So within this, there's, a, there's uh, two layers. There's a little clear layer of plastic on the top for those who haven't had it before or for a while. Um, we peel that away first, I'll indicate when, which will give you a, a wafer, a little bit of bread. Uh, we'll all share that together. So wait until everyone's, everyone's received it. Uh, and I'll indicate when we're to share it together. Uh, once we've done that, I'll then indicate um, when you to peel back when you to peel back the second layer um, and to drink uh, the grape juice um, uh, or the wine, which will be be there as well. So as I said, um, just uh, be patient so that we can all share together at the same time uh, in this sacrament the Lord has given us. Take and eat, remembering Christ our King, who 
whose body was given for us that we might live forever with him in heaven. together remembering the blood of Christ given for us for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray together again. Father, we thank you for your great and rich mercy, great and rich enough to deal with and cover completely all of our sins, every one of them. Father, we thank and praise you that you can do through the death of your son that which we cannot even begin to do ourselves to deal with our greatest problem of sin and to give us hope of life beyond death. Father, we thank you and praise you for the, um, the perfect and invaluable goodness of your Son that is promised to us and reminded to us uh, in the sacrament that we have just shared. Father, we pray now as we go forward into the week ahead that we'd be strengthened by your Spirit, uh, strengthened by the, your, the Word, your Word, the Word of God that we've just heard, read and explained to us, strengthened by the uh, the reminder and the encouragement of the sacrament uh, that we've just shared. Father, pray that we go into the week ahead, uh, knowing you and loving you all the more, that you'd strengthen us uh, to be determined to live with you this week and forever. Amen. Folks, we're going to stand and sing our uh, closing hymn or closing song, Take My Life and Let It Be. Let's stand, shall we? My love, my Lord, I pour at 
thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be That brings us to the end of our service and it's been a pleasure being with you to worship the Lord together and uh, be acquainted week by week and remember who we are and that we belong to each other. Uh, I'm going to lead or conclude our service there by reading the uh, words of Paul from uh, chapter 16 of Romans Um, and here are his words here. Now to him who is able to establish you In accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith, to the only wise God, be glory forever and ever, through Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Stay for a cup of coffee or tea and um, mingle and, yeah, 